Good evening. My name is Stephen Wolfolk, and I'm the Director of Programming and Marketing for the Kansas City Public Library. Welcome to this special Truman Day, uh, three days removed, installment in our virtual signature event series. Our guest tonight is Ron James, author of the soon to be released The Truman Court, Law and Limits of Loyalty. James is a graduate of Yale University and Duke University School of Law. He's practiced law in Washington, D.C. for the last two decades and is the author of two previous books, Root and Branch, Charles Hamilton Houston, Thurgood Marshall, and the Struggle to End Segregation, and The Double V, How Wars, Protest, and Harry Truman Desegregated America's Military. Before we get started, I want to mention two things. If at any point you have questions tonight, you can drop those in the chat on the YouTube page, and we will get to as many of those as we can. And if you are interested in purchasing the book, and I hope you will be, um, you can do so at upress.missouri.edu. That's upress.missouri.edu. And if you use the code Truman21 tonight, you will we'll receive 40% off the list price. Um, so check that out. So, all right, um, let's get started. Ron, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you very much for having me, Steve. Thank you. Um, so I want to start um, by asking you, you know, when the publisher reached out to me about this book, it, my first reaction was the Truman Court, huh? Um, so we have Benson, and uh, uh, I, I was at a loss <laughs> to name anybody else that Truman appointed. Um, so I, you know, but reading the book, I kind of quickly changed my tune and I started wondering why has nobody told this story before? Um, so I wonder, could you share with us how you discovered this story or more, maybe more to the point um, when you discovered there was a book to be written about this story? Certainly. And uh, again, it's, it's good to be with you. Um, I uh, haven't been back to Missouri since my, my last book uh, and I was able to spend some time in uh, Kansas City as well as uh, in Independence. And um, certainly without Kansas City, um, no one would have, no one outside of Missouri would have heard of, of Harry S. Truman. Um, they provided the, the, his, his political base and I had a good time with the uh, local NPR affiliate um, when I was out there a few years ago and I hope to be back soon. Um, the Truman Court, the, the idea of the book came to me when I was researching um, my last book, which as you mentioned was uh, The Double V how um, wars, protest, and Harry Truman desegregated America's military. Because what we now know as the civil rights movement began with the effort to desegregate America's military. And Harry Truman was the first president um, in the uh, post-civil rights era, including Franklin Roosevelt, the first president um, to openly express public sympathy to all white audiences. Uh, public empathy, I should say, to all white audiences about the plight of their fellow American citizens who happen to be African American, who are being denied their rights as African Americans. And um, as I delve into the, to the research about um, the uh, America's military, which is now our largest and most diverse in, diverse institution, I saw that this work on the side, which actually it kind of began with researching my first book, Root and Branch, uh, with uh, Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood Marshall, and they're um, working through the judicial system, how Harry Truman became the first president to do what we now expect of our presidents, and that is to use the judicial branch as offense as well as defense. Um, we recall Franklin Roosevelt's um, <laughs> uh, epic struggles with the Supreme Court. Um, you know, culminating in his uh, uh, what became known as his court packing plan that he preferred to call judicial reform. But presidents up until that time had used the judiciary at, uh, I should say, the judiciary had acted as um, a kind of goalie. Um, and presidents would enact their uh, policies with Congress, enact their laws, and then hope that the laws and policies would pass muster with the judicial branch. Harry Truman turned that on its head. And for the first time, we had a president who was using, not just with the Supreme Court, with the federal judiciary, taking full control of the Department of Justice to aggressively push his policies. And now that's what we expect on, in both major parties in the United States. It's what we expect of our um, presidents and our presidential nominees. It seemed like uh, it, it almost came out of necessity because of the, the state uh, that the court was in at the time. Um, I wonder if you can you set the stage for us, you know, go back to the 
the end of the, the Roosevelt administration, what was happening on the, the, the court that made this kind of a special circumstance? <laughs> well, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, unlike, unlike uh, uh, Truman's um, nominees to the court, um, Franklin Roosevelt's nominees to the court are, are well known um, by many Americans and certainly by um, anyone who's, who's suffered his or her way through law school um, because they're widely understood as these profound jurists um, and, and these um, giants and, and pillars of the law. Um, but they didn't like each other. And perhaps that goes hand in hand. Um, they did not get along. And it wasn't just a matter of ideology, which, which it was. They agreed on New Deal policy, but they didn't agree on too much else. Um, but it also was a matter of the fact that they personally came to dislike each other in this very insular environment where they um, had to work closely together um, without the phalanx of um, uh, clerks that, that justices have now. They had clerks but it was not what, what we have today. So they had to work more closely together and they had come to actively, uh, frankly, dislike each other and suspect each other's ambitions. And so that when you end up with a situation which Franklin Roosevelt ended up with, with um, uh, during, oh, I should say, the Supreme Court ended up with uh, where, um, a few justices think that justices appointed by their same president, that that, that uh, the same president who appointed them, that that justice wants to be president himself and therefore is perhaps skewing his votes to position himself. And I'm speaking of uh, Robert H. Jackson, um, who is our, our, um, possibly the finest writer ever on the Supreme Court. Um, which is something to say because he was not corrupted by having to go to law school. He did not, he's our last justice not to go to law school. So he still had his writing ability intact. Um, but uh, the justices came to suspect that he wanted to be president. And then we had William O. Douglas and justices suspected that he wanted to be president. But then they said, oh, William, uh, uh, Robert H. Jackson just wants to be chief justice. And so there were all these internecine battles happening so that they came to suspect each other's votes. And that became a very pernicious force on the court that by the time Harry Truman became president, um, I mean, just really uh, weeks into his term as, as vice president in 1945, the Supreme Court had already in his terms made a mess of itself. So Truman, uh, you know, he, you mentioned early in the book that, uh, you know, it took four and a half years before FDR got to appoint a justice and Truman uh, matched that number um, in the first four and a half years or, or in the first four and a half years uh, appointed four, right? Um, and he starts with, uh, with Harold Burton. Um, and, it, you know, it seems like Truman's approach is, uh, you know, he's appointing friends or people that he knows but it's not necessarily that he's appointing these people because they think they will support him because they're friends or even because they support him politically. He's got his eye on, he's thinking a step ahead. Here's the legal steps that we need to take to do what I need to do. And I need to find justices that support that legal theory. Is that what he's more or less trying to accomplish? He is, but not at the time when he appoints Harold Hitz Burton, um, which is as um, you rightly noted his first, um, nomination to the court. Um, this happens very early in Truman's tenure. And Harold Burton was a senator, was a, most importantly, was a Republican senator. And what Americans understood then, um, just to contextualize uh, briefly for everyone, this was the beginning of the, uh, the Gallup poll, uh, the, the Gallup poll being the uh, gold standard of polling in the United States. And so the uh, Gallup poll um, they, they, uh, when the vacancy came available, um, one of Gallup's most important first major polls was to ask Americans, do you think that President Truman should nominate a Republican or a Democrat to the Supreme Court? And this question today would be anathema. And we'd likely have leaks from the court about how upset the justices were about the framing of the question because we're somehow supposed to believe, even though we're sentient human beings, educated human beings here in America, that an individual ceases to become a Republican or a Democrat when he or she is um, uh, confirmed to the Supreme Court. Now, this is not to say that in, the justices act as Republicans or Democrats. They don't caucus in that way. They don't meet. They don't attend, um, certainly not fundraisers, but even meetings um, with the party. But they have ideas. 
And at this point in 1945, we were able at least for the average American to we're able to recognize that it's okay for these nominees to the court to have these ideas. And overwhelmingly, Republicans and Democrats, as polled by Gallup, said President Truman should nominate a Republican to the court because we've had all these nominations from Franklin Roosevelt um, with the Democrats to the court. Franklin Roosevelt nominated, if I remember correctly, I believe it's 263 federal judges, and I believe four of them were Republicans. Uh, so Americans paid attention to that and said, well, we should have balance. There should be political balance on the court. And Harry Truman, who's trying to solidify his own position now as a vice president who is suddenly sworn in to replace a giant, the only president that millions of Americans ever knew, Franklin Roosevelt, our only four-term president. Harry Truman is trying to solidify his political position, not just with the Congress, but with the American people. And part of the way that he can do this is by recognizing that maybe I should nominate someone from the opposing party. So he nominates Harold Burton, whom he knew. Um, and Harold Burton was um, a, a, a solid, a, a, for lack of a better term, an uprighteous figure. When he was mayor of Cleveland, he was known as the Boy Scout mayor. Um, he, one of his claims to fame is that he appointed Elliot Ness uh, to uh, um, run the, the uh, police department there in Cleveland and help clean things up. Because when Harold Burton was elected mayor, Cleveland was, it was a disaster. And he helped clean the, uh, not just clean up the crime, but also clean up crimes infiltration into the local government there. And so it was a very successful nomination for Harry Truman. The, uh, Truman and Harold Burton were, uh, they were friendly. They were not friends in the way that Truman's later nominees were friends. But this was a political masterstroke by the new president who was viewed by millions of Americans as an accidental president, who was the senator from Missouri, who was first sent by the uh, Pendergrass machine up there, and other senators refused to recognize, some other senators refused to recognize him as a senator. Um, and even as some senior staffers said, um, he was sent over here by gangsters. And then he is elected in his own right, um, uh, strongly reelected to be uh, the senator from uh, Missouri, and then chosen by Franklin Roosevelt, not at all Franklin Roosevelt's first, second, possibly even his third choice. But um, Harry Truman had support. Harry Truman had supported as senator. He had supported uh, Roosevelt's uh, so-called court packing plan, and that was the end of the day litmus test. So Roosevelt said, "Well, if everyone can get along with uh, this Senator Truman, he can be on the ticket uh, because he didn't oppose my uh, judicial reform plan." And uh, Truman, when he becomes president, so suddenly um, uses this first nomination as a chance to seek some political unity, not just in Washington, but in America as a whole, um, because Americans then were allowed to openly say there should be a Republican or a Democratic nominee to the court. You, you know, one of the things that I really like about the book is the, the Truman Court story is great, um, but then there's also these little bits of history that are dropped in, sometimes relevant, sometimes sidebars. Um, but just the what, how much has changed and how much hasn't changed. Um, and what one of the things that comes to mind with Burton was you write in the book um, that Truman and Burton um, uh, shared a belief that the government should protect Americans from subversive threats, um, even at the expense of their individual liberties. Um, and it just strikes me as was that a common thing at the time for a Democrat and a Republican to agree on something that profound? it became more common with the um, rise and the perceived rise of communism in the 1930s. Um, and it, there, there, were, there were legitimate concerns um, in the late 1930s and, and going forward about, the, about not necessarily communist infiltration of the federal government, but about communist activism in the United States. And so that was something that members of both parties were able to, um, not all members, but some members of both major political parties were able to find common ground um, on agreeing that uh, there will be some cost to suppressing this um, rising movement, but we must suppress this communist movement. 
and um, Senator Burton and Senator then Senator Truman found common ground. And when Truman was president, um, he knew he, he understood how um, Senator Burton felt about those issues. And it uh, proved to be a good choice going forward into the 1940s from the standpoint of the Truman administration. And if I recall correctly, at the at the time, there, there was one Republican left on the court, correct? Yes, and, that's right. That's right. So and, Burton made two. That's right. So it was eight to one, and that that led that was part of what uh, uh, Americans and we're talking just your average newspaper reading American citizen um, is thinking that um, Franklin Roosevelt was frustrated, and we saw the frustration, and it became this enormous deal that he wanted to enlarge the court, but now. We have eight votes of Democratic nominees and one vote of Republican nominee, and they wanted some uh, a move toward restoring some balance on the court. So again, it, it was a it was a it was a um, it was a good chance for the uh, very new unelected president, and um, he took full advantage of it. It was a political masterstroke for him. So kind of right out of the gate, um, Truman sets the the stage for his involvement with the court. Uh, when when uh, Burton is sworn in, Truman's in the building, right? He's there, he's there in the room, and this is the first time that a president has done this? That's right. For the first time ever, a sitting president uh, walked into the Supreme Court when it was in session. So um, it was for uh, uh, the, the well, then-senator, the new justices, um, ceremonial swearing in. He had already been sworn in officially, but for the ceremonial uh, swearing in. And all the justices rose, the, the, um, the, the clerk of the court called, uh, called everyone to order, told everyone to rise. And all of a sudden to everyone's surprise, Harry Truman comes in through the side door and um, sits down uh, behind the, the council table. So he's not sitting at that council table, sits down behind the bar, which is actually the bar. That's why there is the bar. Because if one is not admitted to the bar, one sits behind the bar and sits there and he's just glad handing everybody and having a great time in the Supreme Court building. And let me correct myself, the justices are not there yet. And so uh, Truman comes in before the justices. And uh, so Truman's glad handing, shaking hands and all the news, the newspaper men and they were almost all men at, at that point. Um, and they're, they're all taking pictures and everyone's a buzz and, and can't believe the president of the United States is, is here in the room. And then the clerk calls uh, court to order, oye, oye. And then the justices come in and Harry Truman rises with everyone else and the justices come in uh, and they have, uh, they have the ceremonial swearing in. And then that's when the clerk again for the third time stands up, calls everyone to order and the justices rise and Harry Truman exits and uh, essentially, you know, uh, lets the building to uh, the uh, Article Three branch of government. But it really was a, uh, an extraordinary moment of comedy for our, uh, and a, not comedy, but C-O-M-I-T-Y, um, comedy for our, uh, uh, showing of comedy for our government, a showing of respect um, among the branches for our government um, that I thought really was uh, uh, something that uh, I had not read a whole, uh, a whole bunch about. Was that a calculated move by Truman? Was he, was he thinking at that time, I'm going to be there and show that I'm not going to be pushed around or that I'm going to be an influence here? Or was he just supporting a, a colleague? I would say, um, without hoping hoping not to appear as a cop out, I'd say a bit of both. And that Harry Truman was an extraordinarily astute politician. And that's not a pejorative. One doesn't come from where he came from, having no job after returning as an infantry army captain and living in his in-laws house to becoming president of the United States without being an extraordinarily astute politician, being good at the craft that he chose and that in some ways actually chose him. Um, secondly, though, part of why he was so good at it was because he had a good time doing it. And um, he thoroughly enjoyed himself. And when he came into the court by, by, by all accounts, um, when he, he came into the Supreme Court room um, that day, he he had a grand time, um, when, which I'm sure we'll discuss later. But when he, when he, each time he swore in one of his justices as he threw bigger and bigger parties for them, he had a grand time doing it. He enjoyed it. He enjoyed the people. He enjoyed having an effect on what he saw as the better course for America and being at the center of it all. 
there, there's a chance that I'm gonna get strung up here for making this comparison, uh, living here in Missouri, Kansas City. Um, but as, as I was reading some of what you wrote, um, it seemed to me that there, there were some comparisons that could be drawn to our most previous president, just in terms of um, the, the personality and kind of the, the, the perception of kind of a bull in a China cabinet, um, bullying his way through everything. Uh, you had a moment in the book that you talk about uh, uh, resignations and somebody asked him if he had asked for any resignations. And do you remember what he said? Uh, yes, he said, I, I've asked for everybody's resignation. <laughs> I expect them all and I'll accept the ones I want to accept. And this was after, uh, the, and these resignations to be clear are resignations of Franklin Roosevelt's appointees. So we have this um, president who becomes president upon what appears to America to be the sudden death of Franklin Roosevelt. It's traumatizing. They can't believe he's, he's dead. Whereas insiders knew, uh, I had an idea of how sick Franklin Roosevelt was. Harry Truman was flabbergasted um, the first time he had lunch with Franklin Roosevelt and saw how sick the man was. This is not something that the voters who went to, to um, cast their ballots for a fourth term for Franklin Roosevelt had any idea. They had no idea how sick um, he was. So they're, they're, they're stunned by his death, which, you know, we see the old footage of, you know, um, um, people of, of different races crying in the streets, grown men and women crying in the streets. Um, for the loss of this man. And then we get this senator from Missouri um, who comes in and, which, you know, it's so Admiral Nimitz, which come, who, who comes later and has nothing to do with this, but it's just, you say, you know, Admiral Nimitz said, when in command, command. And uh, Harry Truman had that ethos uh, uh, from when he came in and he uh, wanted everyone's resignation and, uh, and accepted those uh, from whom he wanted to accept them. So uh, if, if you're gonna use the Supreme Court to advance your agenda, or if you're hoping to use the Supreme Court to advance your agenda, um, you need to have solid backing in the Justice Department, um, right? And uh, and Truman takes steps there, um, also kind of make getting an appointment that, that's close to him um, in Tom Clark. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how he comes to head the, the Justice Department? Yes, yes, I can. But I, I don't want to leave you hanging on your on your previous analogy because um, regarding our uh, the, the immediate past president, um, in part so you don't get left out there on uh, on your own on that on that comparison. That actually was something I spent um, you know the better part of four years thinking about um, because uh, there there were um, many Americans who simply believed that Harry, that Harry Truman was not up to the job that he. Simply, he, that he simply wasn't smart enough for the job. Um, Americans had an, an idea of the certain type of person who should be president of the United States. And that person, especially after um, having elected Franklin Roosevelt to four terms as president, um, that American had a certain pedigree, a certain background. And so we had Calvin Coolidge, we have Franklin Roosevelt, even we have Herbert Hoover, whom they threw out on his ear, <clears throat> but no one doubted the man's intelligence and wherewithal for the job. And suddenly we have Harry Truman who's using curse words in press conferences. Um, and in fact, there's, uh, there, there are two famous cartoons of um, w uh, women pulling their children away um, and the, the kids are kicking and screaming. She says, we have to leave now, the president's talking. Um, and so there, there, there was this idea of, of, uh, that we have this crass bore suddenly in the White House. Um, Truman was, was aware of that, as I think our immediate past president was aware, aware of it as well. Um, I wouldn't draw, I think it's more of a stylistic um, comparison and a, sure. an example of a shock to the system in that um, you have, um, if you take uh, uh, President Obama with his urbane nature and his Harvard education, you take Franklin Roosevelt with his urbane nature and his Harvard education, and then suddenly, the coin is flipped over. It's a shock to the system, and and I think it's I, I think it's an excellent point, Steve. Um, that I've actually spent a good uh, good amount of time thinking about over the last few years um, about how that how that was a shock to um, Americans reading their newspapers or listening to their radio, um, and it's saying who who even is this guy and what's happening here, um, and he's in charge and we're at war, uh, and, and so and and it kind of came uh, uh, to a head. Uh, in later times, and part of why it came to a head, it was in part because of his Supreme Court uh, nominees as he just began to nominate his friends. 
Um, which brings us to Tom Clark, one of his friends. <laughs> um, he nominated Tom Clark to be uh, uh, Attorney General of the, uh, uh, of the United States. Um, it, it, Tom Clark at the time was, uh, gosh, a, a year older than I am now. I'm 44, Tom Clark was 45 at the time. Um, was it, it, Clark had been an un, unexceptional law student and actually had ended up in Washington by accident then that Franklin Roosevelt had wanted to hire Tom Clark's older brother who was an exceptional law student and a big shot lawyer and um, was by all accounts on his way to doing grand things and um, Tom Clark's older, older brother said, no, I'm doing very well here in Texas. And so then the uh, senator from Texas said uh, to the White House, well, I've got his younger brother. Will you take him? And they said, fine, send him up, send him up. And they gave uh, Tom Clark initially something of a lackey job in the Department of Justice. But Clark worked, him, worked his way up. What he might have lacked in um, perhaps academic ability, he certainly made up for in work ethic. And uh, he became Truman's attorney general and um, became very successful in being an aggressive attorney general, in part because he recognized that he was not the best lawyer in the building. And so what he did was manage the uh, Department of Justice and say, what can we do to advance the administration's agenda? Now we expect that of our attorneys general. Uh, and the president certainly expects it uh, of, of the attorney general. But at the time, but, but prior to that, the attorney general had generally been a, a kind of like we think of now as the, uh, at least lawyers think of now, the, the solicitor general as this exceptional lawyer with these impeccable credentials. Now it's like, no, you can get someone in there like, um, uh, uh, President Trump had Senator Jeff Sessions in there um, and carrying out his, his agenda. And uh, President George W. Bush um, had uh, Alberto Gonzalez. Neither of those are these great, incredible legal minds. They were effective, though, for the time in which uh, they were there in carrying out the uh, president's agenda. And that I, I would contend that that began in earnest with uh, Tom Clark working for President Harry Truman. And Clark is, is later, we're going to come back to him because he becomes one of one of those Supreme Court appointees. Um, but is, is Truman thinking that at the time? There's no indication that he is. Um, so, you know, the, he gets some traction um, immediately with Burton, um, but the, the real moment for, for Truman is uh, is Vincent, right? This is, this is the guy that probably, if there is a Truman appointee that has a legacy, that's probably him? Yes. Um, and Fred Vincent, it's, it's kind of strange and, and a bit sadly ironic how little known he is known uh, he is today uh, among Americans because at, at the time of his nomination for, this, uh, for the Chief Justiceship, he was um, one of, if not the um, biggest man in Washington, uh, particularly not including the president who always stands uh, at the time, all him it always stands by himself, but he um, had held so many jobs of monumental importance uh, to the American economy. Um, he had been treasury secretary. He had been, um, we now we call a, a OMB um, director, but at the time it was, it was Office of Emergency Management dealing with the war. He had been a federal district appellate court judge. He had been a member of the House of Representatives in, uh, from the state of Kentucky in which he was the preeminent authority, uh, both houses of Congress recognized, which is very difficult for the Senate to recognize anyone in, that, in the House um, as being a preeminent authority on something. He was recognized as the preeminent authority on taxation. Um, and he was known as a, a, a grand orator, one of, the, one of the finest orators ever to uh, be elected to Congress. And um, so when he was elected, chief, when he was elected, when he was, nominated uh, to be Chief Justice uh, by President Truman, there were great expectations um, for him. He was perhaps the only nomination that had great expectations on his shoulders from the time of his nomination. Um, and uh, Fred Vincent was truly a public servant. Major League Baseball wanted to, uh, tried to lure him away um, with, uh, by, uh, by allowing him to be commissioner. And um, he turned down the salary, much uh, turned down the job, much to the chagrin of his uh, beloved wife, Roberta. Uh, it's more money than they ever had even thought of having 
in uh, in their lives. Uh, one year of the salary of the commissioner of baseball, but Fred Vinson was uh, he was an excellent baseball player back in his day. He was a big baseball fan and he was excellent with numbers and uh, Major League Baseball wanted him and he turned down the job uh, because World War uh, World War II was happening at the time and he thought that he should remain in service to his country. And if I, if I remember correctly, you, you say in the book that the, the baseball commissioner was going to pay $100,000 a year. His government salary was twenty. That's right. And that was his highest government salary. That was his peak government salary um, at the time. Um, and even his, <clears throat> his fellow justices, uh, once um, Vincent was confirmed as chief, as chief justice, his fellow justices um, appreciated the sacrifice that he'd made. Even William Douglas, who, um, Justice William Douglas, who had very little uh, nice to say about uh, Fred Vincent and uh, or about <laughs> too many other of his colleagues as well. Um, but he really appreciated the sacrifice that uh, Fred Vincent had made um, because they knew that um, he did not have very much in the way of, of uh, um, money, finances, or insurance, as Douglas put it at that time. And uh, Benson, if I recall correctly, he actually gets on the bench and then leaves the bench, right? And goes back into uh, bureaucracy um, and then is nominated um, for Supreme Court, not as a appellate judge, but as a cabinet member, right? Right. He's um, he's on the uh, he's on the bench. Uh, he's nominated by Franklin Roosevelt um, to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, which is kind of seen uh, even to this day and accurately so as the second most important court, um, federal court in the United States. And he serves on there. And then World War II breaks out and Franklin Roosevelt says, I need you. And uh, frankly, Vincent is eager to get off the bench and participate. Uh, more actively um, in the war effort. He had, in World War I, he, uh, World War I, America's involvement in the war ended just as uh, Fred Vinson had finished basic training. So in his mind, he felt like he had missed out on World War I, and so he wanted to contribute now um, in his later years in World War II in a more uh, direct manner. So um, he left his lifetime appointment um, with tenure and the pension and everything that comes with it and um, agreed to become a, um, cabinet member for Franklin Roosevelt, hopscotch to different jobs. I mean, he was holding so many different jobs. The Senate actually stopped holding confirmation hearings for Fred Vincent. Then they stopped holding votes for Fred Vincent. So the White House would send a, 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 a the nomination sheet down and say, Fred Vincent is nominated for this, the uh, um, uh, Office of Emergency Management, um, and or even when he became was nominated for Treasury Secretary. And they said, we're going to do a voice vote. Uh, a voice vote. Um, and so they, they stopped having any debate because they all knew him. They had voted on him so many times. Um, they said, this is a matter of course for us. Um, and uh, he was serving as treasury secretary, which was uh, for President Truman, which was a job that he loved. He loved that job. And I think perhaps the only job he would have left it for would be to become the chief justice. Uh, I, I hope that people will read the book um, but if they don't, I, I hope they will do their own research on Benson because this guy is just such an incredible character in American history. Uh, in baseball parlance, he was kind of a, a utility player, right? He, you know, presidents over the years would plug him into whatever position and whatever job they set him to, he was tremendously successful um, right up to his stint as Chief Justice, right? Yes, he was, but he was unable to... Uh, continue that success for too long as um, as Chief Justice, um, in part through some fault of his own, and other parts through no fault of his own. Um, but it's a it's a it's an extremely difficult job, as you know, frankly, as we're seeing now, um, how difficult the the, um, the job of Chief Justice is. One is the um, first among equals, um, and that's a very nice phrase, but in um, pragmatic terms, in practice, it makes for a tough job. Uh, but he, he was he was probably the guy that was needed, right? Because his his predecessor as Chief Justice uh, Stone, right, um, very much believed in debate and argument. And uh, um, Benson comes in to this environment where consensus building had kind of gone out the window. Um, was he uniquely qualified to play that role? Well, he was believed to be. Um, he wasn't successful. Um, again, he, he did replace um, uh, Chief Justice Stone, who was a superb legal mind and, and a fantastic justice of the court, um, but not a very successful Chief Justice 
of the court in that, as you noted, he he loved debate. He's a former Columbia law professor and he enjoyed debate and the debates uh, were, were, um, were referencing happen at the conference. So these are the, the debates where the justices, um, which they still do to this day, hammer out their uh, ideas and thoughts on each individual case. It's in a room, nobody else is allowed into this room. Um, when the justice are there, the junior justice, who is now uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett, um, when they run out of water, she has to go fill up the pitcher and get the water. If they need a book, she has to go out and get it. Um, when there's a new justice and that justice becomes a junior justice, he or she will have to do that because no one else is allowed in when they are having these debates. And Chief, Just, uh, uh, um, Chief Justice Stone loved the, loved the conference and it would go on for hours, and, but he didn't recognize that it was ruining the court. Justices were dying to get out of there. They, votes were not changing. They were just having these academic discussions. Um, Chief Justice Vinson, um, particularly as, as a manager, as a master manager, as you said, he had worked in the bureaucracy. He was an excellent manager. Um, he was able to get the conferences going. As uh, Justice Felix Frankfurter said under Chief Justice Stone, he said, we were never, we were never able to get out of conference. Um, so just imagine if you're in one of, you know, a meeting with your job and you just can never leave because the boss never lets you leave, go home. Um, and the conferences were held on Saturdays. So um, this is after the, you know, the, the, the work week. Um, so you can imagine, you know, the, the effect this is having uh, on morale. And um, Fred Vinson was interested in getting results. What's the vote? What, uh, what, what's your reason for, their, uh, for your vote? Let's move on. Next person. What's your vote? What's your reason? And able to have some sort of discipline um, into the conference. Um, so I, I, I don't want to, to shortchange um, Tom Clark and Sherman Minton, but we, we have a lot of audience questions and I've kind of been uh, moving a little slowly with follow-ups here. So um, I wonder if we, we could kind of lump the, the two of them together um, because Tom Clark and Sherman Minton, here's where we really hit a tipping point with kind of uh, public and political pressure on Truman for uh, cronyism, um, right? Is, is that's these right. two guys? That's right. That's when it begins. It, it it begins with Tom Clark, who at least had been Attorney General, um, and then it continues. It, it reaches a frenzy. Frenzy might be strong. It, it reaches the the uh, a furor with um, Justice Sherman Minton, which is kind of unfair because Sherman Minton had served on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals for years and had an outstanding record there. Um, he was a former senator from Indiana, had been a hardcore New Dealer, uh, even more hardcore than, than Harry Truman, who had been kind of a, representing his, you know, state in the middle of America, had been kind of a middle of the road um, person who stuck with the president because he, it was his party and he knew it was politically the right thing to do and where his, uh, where his state constitu constituency was. Sherman Minton, when he was a senator, um, was a rabid man such so that uh, he only lasted one term in the Senate, which is, you know, it's tough to do these days to be a one-term Senator. It was a very tough back then to do it, but he was um, so, so fervent uh, for the Roosevelt administration's policies. Um, and that came back to haunt him even after he had served for years um, and distinguished himself on the Seventh Circuit um, Court of Appeals. So by the time President Truman nominated Sherman Minton, whom he had passed over to nominate Tom Clark, everyone was so certain that, that Sherman Minton was going to be the third nominee when this vacancy came avail available, that President Truman actually called uh, uh, Sherman Minton to the White House to tell him in person that he was not nominating him, which is kind of like a bit of heartbreak hotel. Uh, you can imagine going to the White House and you're thinking, well, I'm going to be told I'm going to be nominated. You get there to only to be told that you're not going to be nominated. Um, but um, it, it, so he was not nominated. Tom Clark was the fourth nomination at that point. Truman did not consult with anybody. He knew he was going to nominate Sherman Minton. It was incredible that he would have four nominations. It was simply not a question for him. And he nominated Sherman Minton to the court. Um, uh, Sherman Minton did not serve long, but he was a force on the court in large part because of his personality. He, had, he suffered from heart disease. Um, he was kind of an explosive personality, and particularly in the area of civil rights, he would really literally pound on the table, telling the justices that they need to do the right thing here, that the constitution forces them to do the right thing, and they need to 
essentially have some guts and do the right thing. And uh, in fact, at one point, they thought uh, when we get to the Brown cases in 1952, the first argument of them, um, some of his fellow justices were worried. Um, actually, before those, actually, when we're still back in 4950, they were worried that he might have a heart attack during the conference. He was so exercised over this and, and, and the thought of why are we debating these issues that are so clear under the Constitution in Sherman Minton's mind. Uh, there was also a story, I, I think it was with Clark, but maybe it was with Minton um, that, that kind of made me retrace my steps and think, okay, there, there are some pretty solid differences here as well. Um, because uh, Truman um, asked that Hell to the Chief not be played at the swearing in for, was it Clark? Um, because he wanted it to be his day. No, that was for uh, Chief Justice um, uh, Chief Justice Vincent. Vincent. And, and to put that in perspective for folks, just very briefly, so is, is that um, Harry Truman did not have an inauguration when he became president. He was sworn in um, by Chief Justice, who actually did, uh, Chief Justice Stone, who did, actually did not even have time to put on the robe. Um, he was just wearing his suit. And so um, Truman, uh, this is my own thought and reading into it and from reading the correspondence and thought, no, my, my conclusion was that Truman decided that he was going to give um, the Chief Justice the inauguration that he had not had. So he had the swearing in at the White House, um, which we saw was actually still a bit, it's still controversial to this, to this day when presidents do that. But President Truman did it and had a huge party and invited members of the public. And this is back when members of the public could just come on you know, through to the White House and they had the band and everything. But you're correct, he, did, uh, he asked that Hail to the Chief not be played so that it would be the Chief Justice's day uh, there for uh, Chief Justice Fred Vincent uh, to be sworn in. Um, I wanna to get to a few audience questions here. Um, so somebody asks, uh, how do we get back the balance of power among the, the three branches? Um, and that's and it, kind of interesting in this context because um, uh, in, in a lot of ways, Truman was working to bust that, that balance of paper power in order to get things done. Um, but you, how would you address that? How do, we, how do we restore kind of the balance to the three branches of government? Uh, first, I'd say, I would not say that he was trying to change um, the balance of power. I think he was trying to bring in um, another player um, the most reticent player in our government, which is our Article Three branch. They are supposed to be the most reticent player. Um, but I agree with the premise of the question that we are out of balance. We're deeply out of balance right now as a country. We are, it, it's, it's extremely problematic. Um, and the bottom line is, as I see it, is, in my opinion is because Congress has to start doing its job. Well, there's this constant talk that we have these three co-equal branches of government. We have the co-equal No, Congress is supposed to be the most important, powerful, it's supposed to be the most powerful branch of government. That's the way the Constitution's written. That's why they're Article I. However, Congress has decided and began deciding during the Truman administration to accede its authority. So that its first duty to declare wars, we're going to allow the president to have what he calls a police action. And part of it, the steel seizure, part of why Truman lost the steel seizure case was because he had his um, solicitor general arguing that we're arguing to the justices, we're at war. And you had the justices saying back to him, the president has said just last week that this is not a war. Is this a war or not a war? And so the administration was tying itself to the knots. That knot is a result of Congress not, not doing its job. And since then, Congress has abdicated that responsibility, the passing of a budget. The passing of a budget, Congress doesn't pass budgets. We get these continuing resolutions that go on and on. Then we get these government shutdowns that happen. So there does need to be a restoration of the balance of power. It has to happen with Congress. And really when we talk about Congress, we're talking about the Senate because the House still functions. Whether one likes what the House does or not, the House moves. The Senate had just has, has stopped functioning, stopped doing its basic, fulfilling its basic responsibilities. Um, I think it's a matter of individuals Frank, I've, I've been in Washington for more than two decades now in private practice, local government, and federal government. I think it's a matter of too many individuals enjoying the lifestyle and not fulfilling their responsibilities that they're supposed to do, which is make hard decisions. And if you get thrown out, you get thrown out. The way Sherman Minton was thrown out of office um, at, by the voters of Indiana, you get thrown out and you find something else to do. But um, th that's how we restore balance. You can't have three players and one player just decides that it's not going to show up. Um, that plays nicely in, into another question here. 
Um, they mentioned a, a recent interview you did uh, with uh, Gary Goldman, and you mentioned that Congress might be the weakest branch of government right now. Um, how, what, what can what can the people do? I mean, you know, we, we've seen we, we vote for different folks and, and things don't necessarily change. How do we affect change in the Senate? It's, it's difficult when we get uh, uh, corralled. I think co Congress is is certainly the weakest branches, but not by design. So you have the, the you know the the, per, the the branches designed to be the strongest ends up being the weakest. That's going to be problematic. But we get corralled into these gerrymandered districts um, that 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 we have, um, and so then so that the um, officials get to choose the voters rather rather than the voters choosing officials. Um, but again, the larger issue though still exists statewide with the. Um, with the Senate, and I just think um, we have to get uh, votes. They just we just have to call these votes, you know. And it began. And it, and it began. I I don't I don't like the whataboutism, and it's both sides. I think what the current Senate Majority Leader has done has, is is um, I think he's taken the baton and run with it. What he did during the Obama administration was just I'm I'm still flabbergasted by it, um, by just stating that we're not even going to meet with a Supreme Court nominee, but. If you rewind the tape all the way back, we go back to Senator Chuck Schumer. We had Miguel Estrada, who was President George W. Bush's nominee um, for the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, which, you met, which we mentioned earlier was a, uh, it still is the second most powerful federal court in the United States. And everyone who pays attention to these things um, knew that if Miguel Estrada got onto the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, he would end up on the Supreme Court unless something catastrophic happened. And so the Democrats just decided we're not voting on Miguel Estrada. And they asked Chuck Schumer at a press conference, they said, what can you do to, uh, what can uh, Mr. Estrada do um, to get a vote? And senators, the senator said at the microphone, nothing. So we begin to, to, to break down the process then, we just end up in a, in a, very, um, in a very bad place. How about, what, what do you think about the composition of the court um, with these, with these three Trump appointees, is there, are, are you fearful of an extreme right um, shift on the court or do you think it'll be maybe a more reserved um, move to the right or maybe not I, at all? I, well, first, I don't, I don't blame, I think that the um, President Trump did what he, he actually did his job in that if there's a vacancy, you nominate someone. Um, I would never fault the president. I, I would ex highly fault the president for not fulfilling a vacancy on the court for for any reason. Um, I don't care if it's eight thirty in the morning on January twentieth. It's like, no, here's my name. Here's the name I'm putting forward. Um, my my big problem right now with the court is almost with the description of the court. It, I I can't. It incenses me this constant discussion of the conservative justices and the liberal justices. No. There might be there. There may be two liberal justices on the court. Maybe um, Justice Kagan, Justice Sotomayor, Justice Roberts. Chief Justice Roberts is a conservative on the court. Um, uh, Justice Thomas is not a conservative. He's a he's a right wing. Um, he's a right wing justice. He's trying to move the court. He's trying to, and, it, and what I'll give him is that he owns up to it. These other, and he's he's constantly writing about this, like. We need to say what we're doing. Um, Justice Thomas owns up to to what he's trying to do. He says, "I want to overturn this precedent," or he says, "The court just overturned a precedent and acted like it didn't." So uh, he's speaking with, I think, an honesty that I wish the others would, because it's not a matter of conservatism to overturn a precedent that's six or seven years old. That's not conservative. That's the opposite of conservative. But if you're trying to move the court, just say, "I'm trying to move the court because I think that's wrong." And Justice Thomas, I think, um, whether one agrees or, or disagrees uh, with his positions, is very clear when he's trying to move the court. He doesn't try to hide it and say, that this, no, it's not a conservative position. I want to move this because I believe this is wrong. This was wrongly decided. Um, and I think that honesty, I think, is good uh, for, the, for um, the American people. I also think that justices should try to um, write their opinion, make their opinions on our biggest issues um, accessible to um, the regular newspaper reading American public. I think you see that a little bit with Gorsuch um, too, right? And on at least the topics that are important to him, like the, the Fourth Amendment, he will signal 
pretty clearly that I, I want to change this and here's what I want you to bring me in order for me to do it. Correct, correct. And that's why I think it's, it's lazy for um, so many of our leading commentators to consistently refer to the liberal wing of the court, the conservative wing of the court. No, 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 that's not the situation here. That's not the situation. And so we should particularly read the justices opinion and, and opinions and, and take them at their word when they're trying to do something, they're telling you what they're trying to do. Okay. Um, so some questions getting more back to the, uh, the topic of the book. Um, somebody asked, Truman's court uh, were strong supporters of church state separations. Their rulings were controversial. It's a big political issue now. Um, can you discuss the Truman court's position on church state separation? Oh, it was, it was, it was uh, controversial because it was largely new then. And you, um, we had the beginning of um, many of the Jehovah's Witness cases um, and uh, objections to policy. And so it was the one of the court's uh, initial forays into what we now call um, the culture wars. Um, but back then the court was very reticent and what, what the court tried to do uh, repeatedly, um, a, a pejorative way to put it would be to punt, but I, I, I think that's a lazy way to put it. What I would say is they tried to restrict their ruling to the facts that were presented um, before them. And that's why we got larger rulings later um, with the school prayer cases and other things that happened during the uh, Warren court, because many of those issues had been decided as narrowly as possible uh, during the uh, uh, Truman times. And, and, and that was due in no small part to the work of uh, Justice Felix Frankfurter, um, who um, particularly as, as uh, 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 the only Jewish member of the court um, was, was um, had, ex, had uh, uh, during a time of great, uh, uh, you know, great open prejudice, um, had, had a large voice on the court um, in that respect. So I think they're, they're I think we saw the beginnings of those um, issues then, but they became larger later. Um, somebody else asks, um, what got you interested in Truman to begin with and where would you rank him among presidents in the last hundred years? I became interested in uh, President Truman in researching my first book, Root and Branch, and seeing how um, the, uh, the, the the struggle, the legal struggle for in what we now call the civil rights movement uh, wound its way through the courts and, and uh, how Truman had such an outsized effect on it, um, particularly with the, the blinding of Isaac Woodard, which um, was it, um, the subject of a recent American Experience PBS documentary. I had the uh, privilege of being in, which um, if you have a chance to see it, I encourage everyone to um, watch that. And so I began to, I was intrigued by him um, in no small part because, and I can say this now after having spent, what are we, 2021, uh, the last whew, good part of the last 12 years doing a lot of research um, about President Truman. And I thought at the beginning, I thought, you know, uh, 1948, I don't think I would have voted for him. And um, I can say now, uh, having done all the research and everything, I, I don't think I would have voted for Harry Truman in 1948. I think I would have probably voted for Thomas Dewey. Um, and that I think allowed me a remove from which to approach the subject uh, <clears throat> and approach the man, not just politically as a, as a you know, political science major, um, and as an attorney, uh, but also just as you know, a, a, an American citizen going through life and getting older. You know, when I started this, I was, you know, 28 and I'm 44 now. And um, I, I, I've, I still find him a highly intriguing subject um, based in large part because of where he came from, where he ended up. And it's, it's, it's cliche, you see it in all the bad movies about, oh, you know, you, uh, you make your own luck. If there's anybody who made his own luck for the love of God, it's Harry S. Truman. He was there in the right place, putting in hard, work, hard work at every single level, whether it's in the mud in, 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 in uh, Missouri, trying to get some money for the roads, um, or as a, as a county judge, or as an army captain out in the mud in Europe, or whether it's as a backbench senator who's being ignored, literally ignored by members of his own party in the United States Senate, and he's still showing up to work, writing letters to the Roosevelt White House and being ignored and still working and working 
And then you find out years later, oh, Roosevelt says, okay, he literally writes, okay, FDR on the proposal for uh, Truman to become his vice president. And the man ends up president of the United States. Um, so we, we have uh, well, one last audience question here that I'm gonna ask you a, a question to wrap up. Um, somebody asked how hands-on Truman was and picking his Supreme Court justices. Um, very, right? Uh, he wasn't asking anybody else any questions by the time he got to the third one. He had a list in his mind. Um, in fact, when Tom Clark came to him, <laughs> when Tom Clark came to, uh, came to the Oval Office with a list, um, he had a list of Catholic nominees because we're going to get to, we're going to have a Catholic nominee to replace Justice Frank Murphy, and uh, Harry Truman didn't even look at it. He said, "No, no, 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 I got that. No, um, I'm going to nominate you." So he had a list in his in his own mind of who uh, of who was uh, going to be the nominees um, uh, to to the court, and they were going to be men, and they were all men at this time, and they were going to be men uh, whom he knew and trusted. And Clark cited no religion, but his uh, his supporters pointed out that his wife and kids were Catholic. Is that, that's uh, right. They said, <laughs> that's right. They said, his wife's Catholic. Come on, that's got to count. And now we've got most of the court is Catholic. It's incredible. Um, so throughout the book, you weave two great um, kind of narratives about uh, how Truman used the court. Um, a couple of the cases relate to unions, and a couple create uh, relate to civil rights. Um, we don't really have time to get too much into those, and I would encourage people, you know, please buy the book or, or get it from the library, whatever. It, it is a fantastic read and you will learn so much. Um, but I wonder if you could just, in closing, um, summarize how Truman used the Supreme Court to advance his civil rights agenda. Truman was the first president to address the NAACP, and he, um, became convinced, again, particularly after the blinding of Sergeant Isaac Woodard, um, that something had to be done at the federal level to protect the rights of American citizens who happened to be African Americans. And he knew from his time in the Senate as a Democrat uh, that nothing would, nothing would be able to get through, uh, through the Southern Democrats in the Senate. And so he began to think of what, two things. One, what can I do by executive action? which he was able to do with the um, uh, desegregating America's military. And then secondly, what can I do with my Department of Justice? And in order to get th things through with his Department of Justice, um, he, want, he needed a good manager at the top, which he had with Tom Clark, and Tom Clark hired good people. And they were all, uh, they were all on the side of the administration and pushing forward, not just defending what the president had done, but pushing forward to move uh, uh, to move the country forward by common law, which is, is, is what we call it. When, when judges decide things, it's, it's common law, building on common law um, in the federal district courts and the federal appellate courts. And, uh, but he realized in order to bring that to, tr uh, to true fruition, he would need, eventually things were gonna end up at the Supreme Court. And on that, again, we get back to it, the man got lucky and he got four nominations. He got four men on the court who in this respect ended up not just going with his administration, but helping to lead um, their fellow justices to what was right. There are still questions about Fred Vincent and dealing once we get to Brown versus Board of Education in 1952, moving to 54, but Truman was not in office at the time. During the Truman presidency, the court unanimously, consistently, without equivocation and very clearly written opinions that any literate American could, understood, could understand argued to their fellow citizens that the Constitution guaranteed the rights to all American citizens, regardless of race. And um, again, if, if there's anyone who uh, made his own luck uh, professionally and politically, it was Harry Truman, but he also ended up making his own luck judicially as well with um, his three justices and the chief justice to the Supreme Court. It kind of embodies the, the adage, uh, luck is where preparation meets opportunity. Absolutely. Um, so I, I want to close with something that I, that I hope might give people a, a little bit of hope um, for the Supreme Court going forward. Uh, one of the things that you, you write in the in the prologue um, about Truman's appointees is they often supported the president who had nominated them not for a sense of loyalty, but rather because they agreed with his administration on critical questions of constitutional law. And I wonder how 
true is that today? Do people worry too much about, oh, Republican appointees are just advancing a Republican agenda and Democrat appointees are um, advancing a Democratic agenda? Is that the case? Or are these administrations just building uh, laws and uh, um, arguments around a constitutional theory that they share with the justices that are going to support them? Uh, no, I think that's a, uh, um, a result of the fact that the uh, major parties, um, particularly the Republican Party, are, are simply less ideologically diverse than they were then. So back then you had, um, e even as recently as the uh, 1970s, but you had uh, Republicans, you had Rockefeller Republicans, you had different kinds of, of uh, Republicans. Back then you had Democrats who were segregationists and you had Democrats from um, the Daily Machine in Chicago. And so they had disparate interests. So it was not a matter of pushing forward a democratic, what might be seen as a democratic agenda because the, the so-called democratic agenda was so diverse back then. So that Senator Richard Russell of Georgia had certainly a different uh, agenda than you know the, uh, the, the Democratic uh, mayor of, of Chicago um, and the, or the Republican governor of uh, New York. Now it's so clearly drawn, um, the, the ideas are so clearly, they so clearly align with party um, that it becomes um, easy. Uh, and I, it, 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 it's, it's just a matter, it seems a matter of common sense to construe um, the justices' opinions with the um, uh, the ideology of the particular party. Is that is that a problem? I think it's a I think it's an extraordinary problem. I think it's a very big problem. Um, I think it's the, I think it's the chief. I think it's the primary problem that the chief justice is wrestling with um, that he has wrestled with quite publicly um, in in opinions. Um, I don't think it's a matter of personal loyalty. I don't think, I, I think we're very far from that. I think the day that a justice gets confirmed, he or she is kind of thinking, okay, thank you very much. I'm here. Um, but the, um, the fact that so many decisions seem to conform so much um, with party ide ideology is a problem. And the, but, but it gets back to the larger problem. I know we have to wrap up, but I just want to say that the, the judicial branch actually has to produce that's the difference here, is that whether one agrees or disagrees with what the Supreme Court decides, come the end of the term, they have decisions for you. You can read them for free. Congress just comes in, comes out, two years, two out, and they talk, and, and so you see the congressional leaders talk about, well, this Congress and this Congress, I, I could, I, and I pay very close atten attention to it, I couldn't tell you what number of Congress we're on right now. I don't know. You know, they come in, they come out, and nothing happens. They, but but the, the judicial branch, the executive branch has to produce because someone's got to run the government. Someone has to turn the lights on. And the, um, uh, the judicial branch has to produce each year, and they do. They produce each year. And when you do that, you're going to upset some people, and you're going to make some people happy. The problem is that we have the most powerful branch that is not producing, not doing its job. And... Uh, more than nature, politics abhors a vacuum. Someone's going to fill that vacuum. Ron, I'd love to have you back someday to, to talk more about the current Supreme Court and, and how we fix the problems that we're facing, if you would be willing. That would be a fascinating conversation. Oh, I'd conversation. love it. Love to talk to you about so, it, Steve. All right. Well, again, um, the book is The Truman Court, and you can get it through our friends at the University of Missouri Press. Use the code TRUMAN21, and you'll get 40% off. Um, I hope you'll give it a look. It's fantastic. Ron, thanks again. It was, this was great. Thank you very much, Steve. Good night, everybody.